Hello, and welcome to Mozart of Hoops, a podcast that takes a deep dive into the world of basketball, how we learn to appreciate its beauty, and understand the ebbs and flows of the game. My name is Ian Quinn, and I'm joined by my two co-hosts, Chris and Owen. Chris, why don't you start us off? Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, uh, my name is Chris, like you said. Um, I'm kind of surprised this day has finally come. Uh, we threatened to do this for uh, a lot of weeks now, and um, finally all the hard work is, uh, has paid off. Um, so for me, this all began... I guess around 34 years ago to the day uh, when Danny and the Miracles took down juggernaut that was Mookie Blaylock and Stacey King in Oklahoma in the uh, 1988 NCAA championship. Uh, and pretty much since then, I've been I've been hooked on basketball. Uh, grew up in the Kansas City area, so I've been a huge KU basketball fan. So that was a, a lot of the driving force behind my my love of basketball. Um, but, uh, I've been a huge, huge NBA fan, uh, you know, growing up through the nineties as a, as a Jordan kid and all that. So, um, and here I am, uh, a wizened, uh, sage of, of basketball, uh, useless knowledge. Not as much as this next guy though. Uh, well, well, we'll see. So speaking of that next guy, uh, Owen, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, yeah. Uh, most people call me his dudeness. Um, you have my parents, uh, my brother, usually not. He calls me Duder, a Duder, you know? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm old. I'm, I'm probably older than Chris. Been watching basketball, uh, ever since I hit a, a hook shot when I was like four and I thought it was Magic Johnson. Uh, but you know, got him confused with Kareem cause I was a dumbass at the time. Um, yeah, I love basketball, Ian. How about you? I, I too love basketball and as mentioned my name is ian um i'm a graduate of uh ithaca college where i studied sports media communications uh since college uh starting a podcast has been a goal of mine um i was born and raised in syracuse new york which is where my love of basketball originated i was five and on april 7th 2003 i had just turned five that day uh and my Syracuse Orange actually took down Chris's Kansas Jayhawks in the national championship for our first basketball title in school history. It's You're quite just simply keep driving that dagger right to his heart. I, I am. And it's, it's quite simply a day that I, I, I will never forget. And now I look forward to analyzing the game we all love. So our first ever episode is about the namesake of our podcast, which is Mozart of Hoops. It's about Drazen Petrovic. His nickname was the Mozart of Basketball, Mozart of Hoops, any any name related to Mozart and basketball. I had a lot of fun researching and watching Drazen play, except for his defense. We, we'll get into that later, but that was awful. Uh, what about you both? What did you enjoy or what did you not enjoy? Let's break it down. Well, as I have, as I've talked about multiple times, like I was hoping we would be like the big dippers and start talking about Wilt, but... You know, this is, this is a good uh, secondary topic. Uh, it's a good I start. Know, I, I, I had, it is. I had fun kind of going back and watching Drowson throughout the years, especially before he came to the NBA. Just kind of noticing the progression and kind of the tendencies in his game that he tried to work out of, but still would just kind of creep back in there. Interesting. The jump yeah. passing. <laughs> yeah, jump passing <laughs> we'll get into. We will get into oh, that. Yeah. What about you, Chris? What did you enjoy? I like the buckets, man. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm like uh, Dudeness with his uh, his pre-NBA days. Um, that's some really exciting basketball. And, you know, not having ac access to that, um, you know, years ago, growing up watching him originally, um, I really didn't have much of a concept. I mean, I knew he was a shooter, but I didn't know that he was a... Uh, uh, as heliocentric as he was in in Europe. Yeah. So why don't we why don't we talk a little bit about um, him in the NBA versus him in Europe? Um, I can I can start us off. I think in the NBA he's one of the better off ball players of all time. Um, in terms of his movement, in terms of just just that stuff, his ability to catch and shoot. Whereas in Europe, he the offense ran through him, and. It was odd almost seeing him so on ball. Um, what what did what do you guys think? 
Yeah, I agree. I mean, I thought, it, to be honest, and I said this a long time ago, um, and I still can't really, I mean, I know, you know, some different comps have been floated, but I still think he reminds me the most of Steph, at least when he was uh, with Real Madrid. Um, it just seemed like he was kind of, you know, he kind of bobbed in and out of the defense. Um, he had the ball on much more of a string than he did in the NBA. Um, it just, he would, he had the confidence to do anything he wanted to, it seemed. Um, so I, I think that's probably, um, you know, I guess the biggest, the biggest difference is like, he just looks like he's going to make every shot that he wants to take in European basketball. Yeah, I think you were the one who sent us that um, Real Madrid game uh, where he was playing Oscar Schmidt, the Brazilian legend. And yeah, he had 62 points. Like, he was on fire. Same with Schmidt. Schmidt was on fire too. But very, the offense was through him. He was on ball. He was dribbling a lot more than he did, say, when he was in New Jersey um, with the Nets. Um, Owen, what about you? What do you What do you think about the difference in his game compared from Europe to the NBA? Honestly, it's his defense. Um in, in Europe, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, in every single game, he, he's just, it's, it's like he's a zombie. He just stands there. He doesn't do anything. He would occasionally, just due to his athleticism and size, kind of be able to find the right spot or use his length. But otherwise, he, he did next to nothing. Yeah, and um, I think that's a, that's a constant throughout his career is his, uh, his defense, and we can touch on that a bit later. But in terms of his offense... What do you think about that? What do you think about what we've said so far in terms of him being more heliocentric compared to off-ball in the NBA? He still definitely displayed a whole lot of on-ball tendencies in the NBA, mm -hmm. uh, more than I think he is credited with showing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, he, he was basically given the keys in Europe and basically told to you know, go out and score the ball, which is part of why his defense was so horrible. I mean, he just felt, you know, I'm doing so much in offense. I don't really have to show that kind of effort on defense. And the NBA was the opposite. He actually had to do yeah. something on both sides of the ball to basically be rewarded mm -hmm. and given the ball to create for himself. Oh, and let's face it. I mean, in Europe, the you know, at the time, like Europeans were not known for their defense. Like, no. I, I don't know that you no. could name one um, at the time he came to the NBA. So, I mean, he, you know, Europeans were looked at for scoring and, you know, offensive creativity and stuff like that at the time. So, um, mm -hmm. well, I mean, even still through the 90s into the 2000s, it was about, you know, just, you know, motion offense, honestly. Passing the ball, just finding the right shot. Not really, you know, driving to the basket so much. Um, definitely not doing anything on defense. Even though there were defenders, there were great defenders. But, you know, the, the reputation carried on almost until today. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely agree with that. The defense is a lot lackluster over there. Um, and I actually, I found a game. I watched a half of it because it was really... <laughs> It's honestly the worst game of basketball I've ever watched, but it was young Drazen. Uh, he was 19, and he was playing in the Yugoslavian First Federal League Championship. And, you know, the uh, the defense was bad. The defense was very bad. Also, everything ran through him. Like, everybody on that team it was it was Drazen's team, and it was kind of crazy because he's 19 at the time, and he's playing with guys older than him, and he was just, I hate that I'm making this comp, but he was about as heliocentric as heliocentrism gets. Um, well, I mean, you know, I mean, if you don't mind me jumping in, I was, I was going to say, doesn't that seem kind of similar to Luca later? Yeah, it does seem very similar to Luca. Um, I think that uh, yeah, I actually think Luca had a bit of a more off-ball game than Drazen did. Really? Um. Uh, yeah. I again, I only watched a half of this, so I don't wanna. I don't wanna sound like an expert on this by any means, but he had some. But it, when he did, it was to get the ball back to him so he could create for himself. Yeah. Um, which is Luca similar? Which is very similar to Luca? Yes. 
I think part of the thing is like it's not that Drazen you know, didn't possess these uh, off ball skills necessarily, especially in his later, you, you know, in his twenties at least. Um, but he's just that much better on ball than everybody else that he's playing with. So yeah, you know, he's he he's just getting, you know, yeah, he it's in his hands. He's the one doing all the creating because yeah, he's just better at it. He just also happens to be. an elite off ball guy who didn't really have to flex that muscle uh, nearly as often until later. They needed to have him have the ball. Um, they, I don't think they really would have survived if they had someone else really handling the ball. What was right. kind of funny about that game was um, NBA players, Dario Saric, um, his father played with Drazen on that uh, team and he was competing against uh, Nikola Vucevic's father. So it was kind of like kind of cool seeing like okay these are the you know these these guys these these guys playing now had sons who ended up going on to the NBA and being you know good NBA players for in Vucevic's case you know one of the best um you know for his position and era not I'm not saying Vucevic is yeah, so let's not get carried away there <laughs> a go contender but he's an above average NBA player so um yeah yeah so that was that was pretty cool um what I you know what i want to talk about really quickly and this is something that i noticed a lot a lot in europe a little bit where he owen mentioned him creeping back into his old habits these jump passes man yeah i see i think there were times that it was like a positive thing like okay you need to get an entry pass into your big fine but it just seemed like he did it on every type of pass. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know. No uh, matter what. Like, like today, I, I mean, certain players, they have the talent and ability to do that. But, um, you know, growing up with, with me playing basketball, you are always taught to never leave your feet when making a pass. If, if you're leaving yeah. your feet, don't pass the ball. That, that's he, an instant yeah. mistake. And um, I think there's times where, like, okay, like you can you can start like a, it's almost like a fake, like you're shooting and then people collapse on you and you find a guy open and you can, that's kind of okay to me. But this just seemed like he would be even on the move. Like he would be driving and just randomly jump and pass it out. Or yeah. it, it just, it wasn't effective. Yeah. Well, it, 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 it's a symptom of his isolation basketball. And it is definitely, it is something that definitely came back with the nets and the blazers it is something that you do see he does it yeah, often. yeah. yeah he has oh, another absolutely. thing that he does but we'll, we'll touch on that in a minute yeah he does uh, go ahead, I, it, it made me wonder if it was like the sort of thing where he did it you know exactly like you were saying ian like it was a situation maybe early on where he did jump and you know defenders flying at him he happens to find a cutter at the last yeah. second and then yep. you know it, it turns that into you know, thinking that this is actually a way to create things instead of, you know, it's just, uh, you know, sometimes it's a thing you can salvage with a quick reaction. Yeah. yeah and I, think, I mean, it's almost like having just like tunnel vision and then like, you know, you, you've decided, you know, right. He's yep. just decided what he's going to do. And then at the end, he's like, well, shit, I'm stuck. And then just <laughs> makes the worst decision. Yeah. And I think like when he got to the NBA, it was a habit that came back and you know, it would it would come back to him, but he did sort of stop. Like he he cut some of it out, but there would be times. If I may, I mean, a lot of it was cut out because he didn't have the ball in his hand. Like he, yeah, you know, exactly. He was catch and shoot. So exactly, yes. Which which leads to the one thing I wanted to talk about is the fact that he was on ball so much before coming to the NBA. First off, when he did start to meet NBA defenses or, or just much more difficult defenses, like in the Olympics, um, he was easy to be taken advantage of when he had the ball, at least when compared to the, the defenses he was used to playing. He almost always had to dribble before taking a shot, which, you know, that's great being able to, you know, you know, dribble into a shot that, that that's that's awesome but even when catching the ball especially in the nba playing off ball passing the ball like oh yeah he's just gonna jack it up for the, the open three no he's, he's got to dribble it a few times then he'll get it up it's just something that i think he got better it, it at that, though oh he definitely did get better at it but it uh, it did happen 
you could just it's something that that I think it just became a part of his game just the fact that he had the ball so much it just it was trained into him so it's hard to get it out yeah and I think like it seemed like <laughs> it seemed like he just really wanted to dribble the ball like I oh, don't know that's yeah. just kind of how it came across to me like it was like oh like I can you know and when he, I, I noticed this early on when I was when I was watching games of him when he caught the ball and didn't dribble, didn't think twice, put it up, he was money, like oh, yes. 90% of the time. When he would get the ball and then feel like he needed to have a counter or make a move or do spin and then whatever, it wasn't as effective. And there were times that, of course, like, you know, sometimes you need to create that extra space for yourself to get a yeah. shot up. But sometimes he he really didn't need to do that. And it just seemed like, I, I and I said this to Chris before we started this podcast, but I wonder if he had it passed, would he have progressed further? Where some of this this stuff would have been cut out of his game? Where I, the... I think it was progressively getting removed. I mean, there were always going to be you know just instances where it flash up, but clearly he was making strides, which is why he was getting more playing time. And mm-hmm. I mean, you could just see it; it was being phased out. Um. That doesn't mean he would develop a whole lot more. He was already getting a bit older, and he'd played basketball forever at that point. Um, mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but but he was clearly making improvements, I think, with just the different coaching and the, the different playing systems that he was in. Yeah, he, he would have... Let's just say that jump passes may not have gone away, but some of the other tendencies would have. That's exactly I think what less I was dribbling. Yeah, yeah, I think less dribbling, uh, for sure. Um, you know, he... His off-ball stuff is, it's really good. So it's kind of hard to, like, I guess it's hard for him to kind of cut out that where he kind of wants to iso, kind of wants to dribble. You know, I said this really early on, but, and it's a la- it's a lazy comp because it was early and I have better comps now. But when he was in Europe, he reminded me of Harden. And when he was in, you know, the NBA, he reminded me more of, of stuff like uh, Chris said, you know, so I do think that it's something that he could have cut out. And I do think those jump passes might've been able to get cut out. However, you know, peak Drazen Petrovic is considered to be the 1992, 93 season. It's probably his best season, which unfortunately happened to be his last, but, um, you know, the, uh, he had started doing those jump passes in the earliest game I could find in 1983. That's 10 years of him doing that, so it's also kind of hard to say, like, oh, yeah, he can definitely stop that. No, he probably wasn't ever going to stop that. But, you know, and to be honest, I don't know that... I mean, I was looking over his, uh, you know, his per 75 stuff, and, like, he was clockwork almost in the NBA. So, like, every single season, it's odd um, that he scaled, like, almost exactly no matter how many minutes he was playing so that probably wouldn't have have ever really changed um but you know he did and and there are other things here to consider like you know the context of the time which is you know Drazen looks like especially if you watch him in Europe he looks like he will gladly take 10 attempts from three every game he oh, yeah. he looks yeah. more than happy to do that but that's not how people played in the nba in the 90s yeah. even recognizing Drazen as an elite shooter elite shooters were not taking you know more than five attempts a game at the high end so you know it, it's it's a little bit different like a lot of this is it's built into his game you know he's a scorer he's a shooter in the nba but he has a scorer's mentality so he wants to create easier looks and he actually is you know a pretty good athlete he's really yeah. good at like um you know, using angles, um, he can get the defenders leaning uh, on some of those dribble moves. Um, you know, he has he does have a really good ability to kind of you know fake and then and then lean um, and get those shots off. Like he's really good at that stuff. So yeah. um, again, that's actually kind of similar to to Luca to bring him up again. Yeah, right. totally. I mean, he's just shorter, but there's a lot of similarities there. So I think there's a lot of you know. It, I don't think it's totally useless. Like you can see him actually, 
you know, he does do a little more creating than, you know, you get into that mindset where it's like, okay, most of his utility is off ball. He's going to screw everything up on defense and he's kind of come down. And if he tries to dribble, he's going to, you know, he's going to do too much and, you know, maybe something bad will happen, but, you know, you can pleasantly surprise yourself watching, especially in 1992, 93, watching a lot of, um, you know, draws and just making nice quick moves, um, You know, because some of this, the other thing is, um, I heard Tim Hardaway talking about this a bit, um, where, you know, at that point, guys were not using dribble moves. You know, they weren't dribbling all over the court. Um, you were using dribble moves to try and create a quick shot. So um, it's not like, you know, in the NBA, he was not anything near like what he was in Europe where he is dribbling all over the court like that. Like he, you know, he was using dribble more moves a lot more succinctly, I think in the NBA, it just was a lot harder because the quality of defense is night and day different. That's probably the biggest difference. Also the biggest, the biggest difference for me too, that I saw was just the size of the competition in general. Um, you know, he was a point guard really in Europe to me. He was six, five. So he was bigger. He could bully some of these smaller point guards. And when he gets to the NBA, everybody's just bigger, stronger, faster, better. Like, you know, it, the competition's just better. Um, so I do think that it is interesting that he transitioned in the NBA as to more of a full-time shooting guard than, you know, a traditional point guard as I kind of saw him in Europe um, with, you know, the Yugoslavian team, um, you know, that's just kind of how I saw it. Um, well, I mean, it was just, he was coming from, you know, being the number one focal point, like the team, as you pointed out, revolves around him to a team where he needs to fit into a role. Now that doesn't mean, in my opinion, that the best version of Drowson in the NBA is going to be off ball. He's going to be catching the ball, shooting it. I, he's a great ball handler. He really is. And so his ability to really attack or shoot, I think that that is actually extremely valuable. Yeah, I, I, yep, I, I totally agree. I do think that him having that ability to dribble instead of being like someone who's more of a pure off-ball guy, like someone that comes to mind immediately for me is a Kyle Korver. You know, I don't see Drazen being that. I see him as definitely more of that, you know, he can create on ball more, whereas Korver really wasn't that. Um, but... I also wanted to touch on Drazen's passing a little bit. Um, besides, you know, we talked about his jump passes, but him on the move in transition, I actually really liked his passing. He was creative, and he would he would snap a behind the back pass in a blink of an eye and hit the guy in stride or hit Chris Morris in stride. It, I was actually pretty impressed about that. What What about you guys? I mean, I think his passing is pretty decent. Um, he, you know, he, the NBA, you know, like we've mentioned, is a, it's a different game. Speed's a little bit different and stuff like that. So he does not get away with some of the, some of the things that he sees, um, you know, that maybe he's making the pass just a split second too late. Um, so I think he, you know, he had some nice ideas, uh, but yeah, he's, he's an underrated passer, I think. Uh, definitely. Yeah, for me, it was just his ability to, to pass off the move, and they were really quick decisions. I mean, outside of the, the the horrible decision and the jump passes, I mean, his ability to kind of like thread the needle to a post player, it was, it was I, I mean, it did impress me. Like, compared to what you see today, it's, I mean, it's very modern. Well, and he, you know, he he did know how to, you know, lure the defender in like i mentioned earlier with you know kind of uh leaning around uh defenders and and using angles and stuff like that so he he had a really good sense for you know when defenders were collapsing and getting ready to pounce on him so he could kind of pivot out of that yeah i, I watched a game against the celtics and well i'm gonna actually bring this game up later to bring up another point um but his passing in that game was some of the best i had seen from him in general um, you know, he was at the top of the key. He would, you know, look at Chris Morris, who would hit a quick backdoor cut and throw him up there for a lob. Same thing with Derek Coleman, or he'd zip a behind the back pass. Just a very underrated passer, I feel. And, you know, if you take away those jump passes, I actually think he's a pretty damn good passer. Um, but obviously those jump passes are a concern because he, he, he just 
It was like old faithful for him. He just went, he just kept going yeah. back to it. Um, okay, so like when he's making these passes, um, is he drawing the defense toward him, or is he kind of almost like creating something from nothing? Uh, I'd say it's more creating. That's at least what I saw. You know, he was guarded by Reggie Lewis or I'd seen both. Campbell. Yeah, but I'd say more so in this specific game that I was, you know, um, referring to. This was him creating something out of. Um, and I'm in transition. I'd say it's more of the um, defense drawing towards him because you know you want to be able to stop him because he can he can just kill you with threes in transition. But yeah. the um yeah so you know he's just yeah I I really like him when he's creating something out of nothing he he was just really able to do that so did he make any I know you talked about the jump passes but did they actually lead to anything in this game against the Celtics his jump passes no I I actually I didn't see a lot of his jump passes in that game um. It's when he just didn't think about it. That was the thing. It, it, it's when he didn't think, and he would, and it was quick. So that's kind of what I saw more. But when he did do those jump passes, it was just a quick entry pass, mainly into the post. Okay. So then, what about his off-ball activity in that game, specifically, like when paired with Derek Coleman? Uh, yeah, Coleman was coming back from injury, so he uh, wasn't playing at first. But yes. He was active off ball. He was constantly moving. He was honestly, he was, he was killing Reggie Lewis, who's a very good defender. Um, just constantly moving, constantly moving, um, you know, in other directions, throwing the defender off. He was scoring at will pretty much. He was finding the open spot. Um, and a lot of that was when Coleman did come into the game, Coleman was able to find him from the post. Um, or um, I believe Mookie Blaylock was the point guard at the time. He would be able to find Drazen. Um, so yeah, he was he was way more off ball in this game. Um, really not doing too much with the ball, dribbling around like he sometimes likes to do. So here's a question: How much of a boost do you think Drazen gets um, from repelling defenders with his body odor? All right. <laughs> didn't he didn't he himself say that that was his best defense? Yes. Yeah. He did say that. Well, it it didn't really work. So <laughs> I I guess I guess I have a question for you guys uh we can move on and then we can get into his defense a little bit which we probably won't have much to say on that. But um how many threes per game do you think Drazen is taking in today's era? In 2022? How many threes per game would you give Drazen? Well, I, I mean, first, like, like, what role is he going to be playing? What, what is he going to look like, um, I guess, play style-wise in today's game? Is he just going to be a shooter? Is he going to be, you know, more of a focal point on offense? Is he going to be coming off the bench? I think he'd be more of a focal point on offense. I don't really see how we, you could make Drazen into just a strict off-ball guy or coming off the bench even. I'd say starter, um, focal point, you know, maybe not the main focal point, kind of like a Clay Thompson-esque role, I'd say, to give a modern, you know, uh, example there. Okay, that's actually a really interesting comparison. Um, I think Clay works far better in the secondary role, whereas I think Drazen is more drawn to being somebody that can probably... You know, do some floor raising, honestly, especially with his ball handling. Yeah, I, I was, I was kind of more or less saying like I was not really comparing Drazen directly to Clay Thompson. I was more comparing, uh, their volume. I'd say, um, that's kind of where I was leading with that. Oh no, no, I, I agree with you. It's, it's. I just think it's a really interesting comparison because I think they probably do get lumped in together a lot in terms of their offensive play. But I think they're still very different. I I know I I definitely agree. Um, and I kind of just answering my own question, I guess I'd probably give him like eight threes a game. Um, if he plays like how he played, I think he's gonna with modern coaching would shoot a lot more threes 
because obviously just knowing what it's like today, you're going to shoot more threes if you're a shooter. Um, Again, I, I think it depends because he, he did have a steady diet of wanting to actually attempt to get to the basket, um, get to the mid range. Um, yeah, I, I think it really depends on the role. So if he's going to be treated as like a James Harden, then yeah, I could easily see eight to 10 threes. But if he is more of, you know, kind of like a microwave, he will just naturally be lower. Yeah, no, I don't think he's going to be James Harden level of volume. But I do think... Because that... I think he would need that to hit eight to ten threes. Because uh, his shot diet... Mm, I mean, even going to want so? to get inside. Let me ask I you do. this. What about... Okay, they function far differently in an offense, but what about... But I think they uh, some similarities in how they're getting their shots, uh, like Orlando Magic, Rashard Lewis, and Drazen. Hmm. Yeah, I think about that. That is an interesting comparison because he's still getting seven attempts. I I really could see anywhere from seven to eight attempts. In, in my personal opinion, I just think that with the way coaching is today, I just don't really think he's gonna. He was already taking what at least three, maybe four. Um, yes. That's kind of. That's kind of like how I see it. I see him as more of, yeah, he's taking 3.4 and 92, and he kind of lowered it actually, 93, went down a whole shot. But I just see him taking more. I just see that is where it would be going. Um, but oh, again... No, no, yeah, he will definitely be taking more. Um, again, just just my, my one qualm is that he just, he's not just a straight up three point guy. So that that's no, that's yeah, he's yeah. yeah, no, I I agree, but at the same time, I I sort of disagree because it's just a diff. It was a different era. People really weren't looking to shoot the three as much. So no, no, yeah. Uh, again, it's it's more about like like what load is he going to be carrying? Yeah, I, I I'm kind of trying to it's say just... like it would be a similar load in New Jersey as I guess now. How many of those mid rangers do you think he would cut out and or drives and maybe take a three instead? Yeah, I got to wrestle with that one a bit. <laughs> okay. I mean, I think that's 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 happening for sure. It's hard to say to what degree though, because I think probably what happened um, between you know ninety two and ninety three is that he did get more confident on ball in the NBA. I think he had adapted to the speed a little bit. He had gotten stronger. Um, you know, and and was a little bit more physically suited to, to playing a faster, more physical game. So I think he was, you know, trying to get a little bit closer in in '93. But which is also interesting because his three point volume, his three point volume went down that year, right? That's why I say that. Yeah, yeah. That's why I say yeah. I think I think he okay. yeah his his three point volume went down because because he was attacking more. Um, yeah. So, but. It's different. Like, so yeah, like, I feel like that's just his more comfortable role. And, and I'm not saying that he's just going to be a pure attacker, but he, he does has that mix. And I think, but if you watch, I think if you, you know, the and I know this is like, you know, obviously a silly sample, but, you know, watching his, you know, that 62 point game that he had with Real Madrid, it was like, he looks like a guy who is hunting for threes. Like, he was looking for that shot. He was not trying to get closer. Like he, you know what I mean? Like he, he, it was, it didn't look like it did in the NBA when, you know, yeah, he's, you know, ultimately you are going to, you know, create a layup or a drive or whatever in Europe. It looks like he's, he's trying to get just a sliver of daylight from three so he can jack it up. See, that's because like, 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 See, like, like for me, I, I think just my my picture of him may be tainted by his his NBA game, but because um, like what you're describing, it just makes him sound like you know he's Stephen Curry out there. He really is, right? <laughs> that's my cop. Yeah, th I, that's what he reminds me of. I mean, that's in Europe. That's what it reminds me of. So it's interesting. I mean, I don't, you know, but the difference is like obviously, look, there's a lot of guys who can look like that in in college. And they get to the NBA and, you know, no, they're, they can't perform, you know, at that level against that competition. And maybe it's a situation like that, but it's just mindset wise. 
is why I say this. Like he has that mindset. Um, oh yeah, where, yeah, he does. Yeah, he he's got the Luca mindset. He if he had the benefit of seeing somebody play that way today, oh yeah, I th he would be all about it. Yeah, I I definitely I definitely agree with that. I can I can lean into that a little bit. Um, well, I want to I want to move on. Um, I want to well, I want to well, before I do that, uh, Ian. Like, do you have any like comparison like other than like Clay? Is there somebody that draws and reminds you of maybe like um, uh, current NBA? It's Bradley Beal. Um, I just see Beal does a lot on ball. Is really good I see, off yeah, ball. I, I actually I do like that comparison. That does seem to fit kind of with my view of him, at least in terms of volume. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can see that. And all, all, my all-time comparison to him, I just feel it's pretty easy as Ray Allen. Obviously not on the same level as Ray Allen, so don't think this is one-to-one. -one. But just they're wanting to do stuff on ball. I see that. I see that both. They're both good sh all-time shooters, both, you know, wanting to do stuff on the ball, sometimes to their detriment a little bit. But that's that's kind of where I see it. But yeah, current NBA, I'm leaning more towards Beal. He's just a better shooter. Rosin is. Then oh, Beal. Then yeah, Beal. Yeah. Yep. I I can kind of agree with that, but I also I don't know. I yeah. I actually don't know. I I I think I might lean. I think I, I might. Seem to recall Ian making a list having like draws and like one of the top five shooters ever. Beal better not have been touching that top ten. So I'm gonna say. I don't think he was. I also don't know if I have draws in top ten. So oh, it depends. Yeah, I mean, I probably don't. But you know, he's yeah, yeah, he's definitely in the conversation. Um, so moving on. Um, and this will be, I think, a, re a relatively quick topic because there's not a lot to talk about. His defense. Okay. Well, I mean, uh, Chris, Chris already summed it up. He stinks. He stinks. Yes. I I do want to I do want to touch a little bit on his it just seemed like sometimes he really didn't care to to play defense um, uh, he didn't well and, i mean I'm, I'm pretty sure he also made it clear to some of his coaches that you know he does so much in offense so you know yeah yeah and I, defense. I mean i keep which, similar to the the george Irvin quote so yeah and i i saw um i was watching a Let's see, it was a Nets versus Spurs game. Um, and Lloyd Daniels and Vinny Del Negro were on the bus and they were, you know, they were coming over to and they were discussing Drazen's relative lack of defensive interest and they wanted to take advantage of that and it didn't take them long. And yes, Lloyd yeah, Daniels. Up by Lloyd Daniels. Lloyd Daniels was attacking him. And, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, Man, like who's I, I didn't even know who Lloyd Daniels was before that game. And you know, it's just kind of odd. And this is when I said I wanted to talk about the Boston game that I watched. They actually Bill Fitch had to remove Drazen from the game because the blatant mismatch hunting, the blatant attacking of Drazen, it, it, they were just giving up points left and right. You know, Reggie Lewis was targeting him. Um you know, um, someone um, like uh, Kevin Gamble. Kevin Gamble, that's who I was trying to think of. Kevin Gamble attacked, was attacking him mercilessly, scoring every time. Kevin they had Gamble a, actually had a pretty good first step. Give him some credit. I, I, I know, but I'm just saying. Attacking him mercilessly, it was like he couldn't, he couldn't play him. Now, Dresden ended up having a really good game because he was able to match, basically with scoring um he ended up they ended up winning that game because they scored 44 points in the fourth quarter and the celtics seemingly went flat but 44 points in the fourth quarter yeah yeah they 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 outscored them <laughs> they were down by 10 entering the third and ended up winning by 10 so it was actually a pretty okay, so kind of what you are bringing up with the, the mismatch hunting um how do you think Drazen would work in today's defense, you know, with the, the change in illegal defense rules. Do you think that that would happen? I mean, of course, it's going to happen, but is yes. it something that can possibly be, you know, covered a bit? I, yeah, I, I do think you can cover him a bit by putting him on 
somebody who's not going to really kill you scoring wise. Whereas I mentioned, you know, somebody like Kevin Gamble, he was actually a pretty decent score. He had a pretty decent volume. Obviously Reggie Lewis was a good score. I think, and this is funny, and this is somebody that uh, I, I've talked to frequently in uh, Discord. I think an easy modern example of putting someone like who's a bad defender, like Damian Lillard, for for instance, when the when the Blazers would play the Suns, the Blazers put Dame on Michael Bridges, and. Bridges is a great player. Don't get me wrong. He's a really promising player. He's not going to kill you. He's not going to drop 30 on you, and it's going to be a detriment. That's not Bridges' game. Bridges is a connective guy. He's a 3 and D type. I think you can live with somebody like Drazen on Michael Bridges, especially considering Dame's probably worse on defense than Drazen was. I don't know what you guys think. That that's kind of my thought of oh, it. Yeah. No. Dame is terrible, but no, come on, man. Drazen's pretty bad. Yeah, Drazen's pretty pretty bad, but Drazen has the size, and I think that Dame this is true. Drazen will occasionally just luck into getting those stops by accident. But yeah, if, eh, man. Well, the no thing is, man. okay, Drazen was kind of like. Uh guess maybe the best analogy i can think of is like a uh a piranha kind of like lazily swimming around on defense um relatively aimlessly and then when there's blood in the water it, it, he would strike i mean so basically if he thought he could get his hand in the cookie jar then yeah he was gonna do that uh if somebody was you know, had the ball in a precarious situation, he was absolutely going to take a horrible reach <laughs> to try and get it. So it sometimes those things panned out, you know, and he obviously got up a little bit more for the Bulls games, even though, you know, you could clearly see him still getting roasted, um, you know, trying to chase screens and stuff like that. But, um, you know, it a lot of it was an effort thing for him um because he had just the way he worked defenders on the other end of the court there's no way he didn't know you know what was happening to him defensively so it's clearly just he didn't care i think when i think when i like finally was like yeah you know what i'm i'm pretty much i'm pretty much out on this guy ever developing some sort of a you know a high energy defensive defensive thing rick fox just annihilated his ankles it was so bad he just dropped them and i i actually thought drazen was hurt for a second and you know rick fox is a good player don't get me wrong but he's not anything he's not he doesn't have elite handles bro that was 1992 rick fox though it was it was but still, still like still not an elite handle it, there no, no. So that that was kind of when I was like, yeah. Eh. Keep in mind, this is before he had his ACL clipped uh, in in Oz. <laughs> yeah, but um, what what I I I my point remains is I do think you can hide him. Do I think there are teams that would be able to? Okay, for instance, I do think the Mavs would find a way to attack Drazen. I think Luca's probably, yeah, Luca's the best mismatch hunter right now in the NBA. So I think that that right there, like that's a that's a difficult matchup. That's going to be hard to hide him on somebody, because Luca 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 even said this on his um, on JJ Reddick's podcast. Um, said he kind of he had this like look on his face, like yeah, I I go after Curry, I go after LeBron, I'm going after these guys. Because I know when I can attack them, I know when I can, I know when I can exploit them. And he had this look on his face, like, "Yeah, this is fun for me." So seeing somebody like Drazen trying to do that, nah, no, nah, he's gonna. Yeah, kill but him. I mean, even including Drazen with those guys, I mean, that's just like saying, oh, "I'm gonna go attack this child." Yeah, that's not fair. No, I know, but I'm just <laughs> saying, like the fact, and even today, uh, I, I shouldn't say today, but on April third, let me put it that way, when we are recording this podcast. You know, the Mavs are playing the Bucks. April 7th? No, it's not. We're four days away from my big day when, as of this recording. This probably won't be out for a week, but just let, 
I'll be 24 soon. So, <laughs> you know, the big two, four. Um, but, you know, today. Um, Happy birthday. Thank you. Um, Happy birthday. Drazen, or geez, Drazen, I said Drazen. Um, in the fourth quarter against the Bucks, Luca was attacking Drew Holiday, was forcing Giannis to do. M- man defense which is not one of it's it's a strength it's it's fine it's you know Giannis is one of the better defenders but help d is really what Giannis is good at and when he was forced to match up with Luca Luca kind of Luca killed him and you know that was kind of like I was like wow like th- this guy's like one of the best mismatch hunters ever okay, so, when so I'm basically sitting, what I'm what I'm getting from all of this is that draws is going to be Luca that's what I'm hearing that's not what I was trying to get at. I was trying to say that I think that Drazen would be mercilessly attacked where he would be borderline unplayable against playing against the Mavs. Okay, but I, I mean, does does that happen in, like, Miami? I'm not saying, like, Duncan Robinson is nearly as bad as Drazen, even though he's not. But how come that defense seems to work? Would Drazen be able to fit into that system? Yeah, because they're they're more of a defensive team. I would I would say, you know, their their bench is obviously more their bench is Duncan Robinson and Tyler Hero coming off the bench who are not good defenders. Whereas in the starting lineup, you look, it's Kyle Lowry, who, you know, is older now, but still a good defender. Um, you know, Jimmy Butler, PJ Tucker, Bam Adebayo, um, Max Struss, um, who's a better defender than um, you know, uh than Robinson and um Hero. That's their starting lineup. They're more of a defensive slant. So I think somebody like Drazen sliding in with where Struss would be. Yeah, I think he'd be okay. But it's still... Also, I think Bam's like the perfect center for him. Well, I actually don't think Duncan Robinson is that bad of a defender. Just throwing that out there. Um, but, but Chris, what do you think? Do you, do you think that Drazen survives defense in today's NBA? I mean, I'm trying to think, like, he can't be literally worse than everybody in the NBA today. No, Trey Young's got him beat there. So, <laughs> Trey, yeah. I mean, the thing is, he's good enough on offense that, yeah, you have to be able to stash that guy in the corner on defense. So, I don't, I don't know. I don't know why you can't get away with it. Uh, especially what he's giving you on the other end. Like, he's, he's so efficient at, uh, yeah, I don't see, I don't see why not. I mean, especially because he has the tools. It's not like his feet are, are too slow or anything like that. So, uh, yep. you know, I, yeah, I think you can, I think you can coach some of that into him. I do think he's got rather slow feet on defense moving laterally. I well, do it, think that's he has, I think actually has really good lateral speed. It's didn't you didn't display any effort on defense. Yeah. That's the problem. Right. So it's very similar to like Stefan Marbury, Steve Francis, who we've happened to talk about before. I don't know when, but I believe we have. Yeah, but we, we have. very similar in that regard. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. But I don't think that he's. I do think you can hide him. I do think, but I. Yeah. This is something that's been brought up before, just talking with people. Not everybody can mismatch Hunt effectively. I don't think you can always mismatch Hunt Drazen effectively. So I do think there's a there's times where he's going. His offense is so good that yeah, he's going to be a net positive on the court. But when I look at like somebody like Luca, I do have I I do wonder a bit if he. Well, could I play. mean, but, okay, yeah, no, I. I fully disagree there. I mean, no matter what, Luca's going to toast him. Luca toasts just about everybody. So it just feels like that's a bit unfair. But I mean, you were talking about like Kevin Gamble. So like, you know, is, is Drazen going to get lit up by Herbert Jones? I, I love Herb Jones. So we can, we can, yeah, I could do a whole, I, I could do a whole episode on Herb Jones, but uh, you know, we only got a few minutes left here. So I, I, I'll save it for another day. But I, what I'm trying to say is, is I think that Luca would force Drazen to play less minutes. Obviously, Drazen's going to be on the court because his offense is good. But I do think he would force him to be taken out in certain situations where they need a stop. Because So you don't think Drazen is just good enough to actually just warrant staying on the floor? Like his offense doesn't offset that? 
Like, is, is his defense going to be so horrible that it is just going to collapse the rest of the team? I think that uh, based on what I watched, and this is just the, uh, this, I watched the whole game, the Celtics ended up getting cold, but it became apparent that they could not sustain with him on the floor in the first half. Well, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I mean, it doesn't, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not placing the blame fully on him. But doesn't this also fall into like Derek Coleman, like Chris Morris was help? Um, they were. They ended up switching Chris Morris onto Reggie Lewis, who effectively helped stop him more. Um, whereas it was like it's just hard because I think Sam Bowie was starting to, and Big Sam wasn't exactly you know limber or timber or whatever at that time he wasn't exactly movable that much he never was in the nba sadly. no well no obviously not but you know he's older um but that's who was starting in the beginning when coleman came in it got better they ended up they were a better team with coleman on the court but i think that when there's something like that um, you brought up the miami heat that's a good team for him to thrive on Totally. He would thrive there. Um, you know, you got you got an elite defender in Jimmy Butler. You got an elite, you know, uh, center, defensive center in um, somebody like uh, Bam Adebayo. And then you also got P.J. Tucker, who's still a pretty darn good defender himself. So looking at that, like, yeah, he's he'll be fine in that type of situation. I don't necessarily think that in this in this game, it it just became apparent that he couldn't be out there. It didn't matter who tried to help or whatnot, because if somebody tried to help, then Reggie Lewis was going to be open. So I think they were, they were like, we'll live with Kevin Gamble <laughs> until we can. Well, and that's, that's basically cool. what happened. But I just think that there are situations where if Drazen was on, uh, I'll bring up my Kings, my Sacramento Kings. If he was on our Sacramento Kings, he would not survive. Yeah, so I mean, I mean, the point I'm trying to make is, you know, I, I mean, of course, it all boils down to the defensive personnel around him. But I mean, that's just every team. There are plenty of teams with horrible defenses players that will see playing time. If he is on an actual team, a winning team, providing production on offense with a sustainable defense, I just don't think he's going to collapse it. I mean, even Utah, Utah's go bear with a whole bunch of nothing around him. Your defense is still good. Well, that's because Gobert's better, best defender probably in the NBA. So, you know, that's kind of hard yeah, to. But I mean, that the point. The point is, Drazen isn't going to collapse that. He's right. not going to collapse the team's defense. It would take Drazen plus this, plus this, plus this. Yeah, I, I I can agree with that. I I was more or less saying like, it's he's going to be on the floor no matter what because his offense is good. And I think that there are a, a, my, a small amount of people that can actually effectively attack him in today's oh, no, game. I, they're, they're, I, um, I think most players can attack him in today's there game. There aren't. Probably all of them. It's just the difference of being able to cover for it and just having the you know sustainable defense. I, I just think it's something that can be covered. It could have been covered for back in the 90s. Even with well. the illegal defense. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, I was just more or less saying that I think that if you and this is going back to my original point and then I'll I'll drop it but seeing Dame being put on Michael Bridges and Bridges really not killing them and Dame still able to put up his you know 30 and 10 that's something I could see happening for Drazen. I don't really see I and I guess you could I guess you could say it for the Mavs too you could put him on Dorian Finney-Smith or something like that. But I just don't think that I think he would be able to survive, but some teams he wouldn't be able to. I don't think he would. I think his defense is that bad. No, no, that, that's fair. I, I think we're just going back and forth. I think Chris fell asleep. So I'm still here. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of what it, no, that's kind of what I did when I was watching his defense anyway. Oh, no, it definitely of... did not. It was fully entertaining for me. Yeah, I agree. It was Are you kidding me? That makes basketball so much more fun watching Drazen get burned. Yeah, that, just that, trying that to awesome. trying to count how many steps behind the <laughs> behind the the screen he was. Yeah, yeah. Well, 
I feel like this was a successful first podcast. We really dealt, dove right into his game. Um, I'm definitely looking forward to releasing this, seeing us grow this uh, uh, podcast. Um, look, really like talking basketball with you guys. Um, anything else you want to add um, about Drazen before we before we close? Um, surprisingly, I, I do have one other thing to add. Um, Wilt Chamberlain is better. He's a better player. That's a hot take. Um, that wow, that's bold. Would Wilt average eight threes in today's game? He could. Are you kidding me? No. Wilt could do anything <sighs> he wanted to. All right. Yeah, no, I, I agree that that's the best thing to in today's <laughs> podcast. <laughs> um, Chris, do you have anything else to add? Um, Wilt Chamberlain could wrestle eight mountain lions before halftime. Wilt Chamberlain seems to be the way we want to end okay. this podcast. Hey, that's fine by me. I, I love no, Wilt. I love Drazen. Man, <laughs> imagine Wilt in the EuroLeague. In all Jeez. respect uh, to Drazen, he, he was a fantastic player. I think he was way ahead of his time, to be honest. Um, I think it's a lot, you know, it's much easier to say that now, um, seeing what modern basketball yeah. has become. But, um, you know, yeah, he's a, a fringe top 10 shooter of all time. Reggie Miller said he yeah. was, I think, the best shooter he ever played against. So um yep. a lot of modern players have said that drazen is one of the best shooters i think kevin durant even said that so yeah i definitely agree there um so well, uh, did, did drazen have the tween has he splashed jimbo hey sometimes he did i've, yeah, he I've seen it from that. him i've seen it yeah, yeah um so anyways <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah certainly does so that 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 concludes our first episode uh, of Andras and Petrovich. We'll be getting into more uh, relevant players, I guess. I think Drazen's pretty relevant. Bimbo but Coles. More. Uh, I don't think anyone Wayne knows who that is. I don't even know if that's a. I, Ooh. I, yeah. He was an actor. Yeah. Let's not. <laughs> anyways, anyways, to bring us back in. This was a great first episode. You guys can find us. You, the listeners, can find us on Instagram at Mozart of Hoops, all lowercase. You can also find us on Twitter at Mozart underscore of underscore hoops. You can follow me on Twitter at Ian Page Quinn, all lowercase and no I in the page, just page like a book page. Uh, Chris, do you, I believe you have a Twitter. Why don't you plug that? And Owen, I know you have a, I know you have an Instagram. Yeah, I'm an influencer. Yeah. So Chris, what's your, what's your handle on Twitter? I think at Twitter, I am at Chamberlain Milt. M-I-L-T. Uh, there you go. Yeah. And uh, Owen, what about you? What about you? You're, you're a, you're a, you're a trading card influencer on uh, yes. Instagram. So why don't yeah. you plug your Instagram? Yeah. If you guys want to watch me twerk my ass, uh, <laughs> my Instagram is uh, his dudeness. His dudeness. I, Got a big old picture of Grand I Hill. believe there's a couple underscores in there. So you might want to. And my ass. I think you, so I believe it's at his underscore dudeness underscore. So you can follow. Yeah, you like can that. follow him there. This will be a lot more smooth the next time. Um, but. Thank you to everybody who listened. We hope to grow this uh, podcast to, and see what it becomes. But thank you for listening. And until next time, peace. Peace.